بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <coughs> So first of all um, I'd like to thank Allah Ta'ala for this opportunity and I want to give my condolences to the Imam of our time and to all of you on the Shahada anniversary of our fourth Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin as Sajjad alayhi salam. May Allah give us the tawfiq to learn um, about this Imam, to pledge our allegiance to him and to all of the imma, especially the Imam of our time, and to adopt um, their teachings in our lives and spread them to others. Um, I want to thank the uh, management of the madrasa for giving me this opportunity um, to uh, be here th uh, this morning. Um, and I want to thank all of you for taking the interest in the topic of tarbiyah, of raising your children um, and participating in today's uh, seminar. So the topic that we're going to be covering is the impact of media on children. Um, and uh, the, the goal behind this presentation is to basically um, to look at some of the responsibilities that we have as parents the responsibilities that we have as parents um, of the importance of raising our children so we have we have uh, as parents you know who have children um, we have additional duties from Allah so it's a time for us to inshallah remind ourselves of these duties and to learn how to fulfill these duties in a better way. And what that involves is looking at media. So today we're going to be looking at media. We want to understand what are the harmful consequences of media exposure from an Islamic perspective. So this presentation is again looking at from an Islamic perspective. And then we're going to be looking at some of the um, Islamically encouraged techniques for parenting in response to media exposure. If we can understand um, what the harm is of media, then we need to know how to respond to that. How is parents, what are some, some practical things we can do? So the first part of this is just trying to analyze and understand um, what is media like from an Islamic perspective? What is media doing to our children? And then the last part is to offer some suggestions, um, some practical tips about what we can do um, in order to fulfill our responsibility as parents better when it comes to media. Okay, I want to um, begin this by first of all reminding us of two traditions from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as um, You might have seen these before. Um, they have to do with the, um, a certain group of people called the Murji'ah. Now the Murji'ah were um, a, a certain school of thought that were active during the times of our Imams um, alayhim as -salam. This was after the death of the Prophet. Um, their major philosophy was they said that it doesn't really matter what you do. Just you know, be a person with a good heart, and then you know, whatever you want to do, and that's not really what's important. Just believe, and that's it. And it's very interesting how in today's world you also have the same type of groups and the same type of thinking. Now, Imam Ali in, in two different traditions, he talks about this group, and he talks about the responsibility of parents when it comes to their children and this group. In one of them he says that, hurry to raise your children and your youth on the basis of the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt wasalam, before the murji'ah get to them. And then in another, another tradition he says that teach your children from our knowledge, meaning the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt, by which, by which with what Allah will cause them to benefit so that the murji'ah are not able to overpower them with their views. Now, it's important to look at these traditions not just looking at it from a historical context, that oh there was a group of people and this is what the Imam Aliyah said. If you just kind of look at it in, in an intelligent way, in a, in a rational way, the Imam Islam is telling us a few important things. One of them is that, number one, we have to be aware of competing ideologies. Okay, there's the ideo ideology of the Ahlul Bayt, and then there's other groups that are out there. Be aware of them, and be aware that they can get to your children as well too. Don't, don't be just safe if thinking that you have a firm faith. That's not enough. You're having a firm faith is step number one, but you also have to take a effort when it comes to your children as well. There's also something else that the Imam is telling us, which is that you have to be actively 
engaging with your children and doing it fast as well too, at an early age, before this ideology gets to them first. As if the Imam is saying that if you're too late and the children's hearts get taken by this other ideology, then no matter what you try afterwards, it's not really going to have that much of an impact. Okay, so this is just a, a sampling of some of the traditions directly regarding uh, tarbiyah and how important it is that we are aware of what's going into our children's hearts um, and how, how important it is for us to make sure that we put, plant the right seeds in their hearts. Now I want to um, look at this. So, uh, first I want to look at some Islamic perspectives on media intake. Okay, now that we've kind of understood the importance of tarbiyah, let's look at media intake. Like, what does Islam say about media? And then we're going to look at some potential harms of media, and then some recommendations, and then some questions. So, um, what are some Islamic guidelines for viewing? Unfortunately, the font hasn't come out nicely on, on the version that you're seeing. On my computer, it's all nice and pretty, but there it's not pretty. Anyhow, what's important is the text. Um, all right, the first tradition is this. Um, we want to look at three traditions, okay, three hadith from Imam Adi We're going to We're going to turn to Imam Adi as our guide today to see what we can understand about viewing media. Okay, now these, are, these traditions are very key. My request to all of you is to, again, not look at them simply. Try to understand the deeper message behind them. Okay, the first one is this. وَالْعَيْنُ جَاسُوسُ الْقَلْبُ وَبَرِيدُ الْعَقْلِ Imam Ali is talking about the role of the eye, about what we see. What is, the question is that what is the impact of what we see? What is the impact of what our children see on them? How does it change them? Alright, so we're going to take this question, we're going to take it to the doorstep of our Mawla, Amir Mu'mineen. We're going to ask him this question, oh, Allah, oh Imam Ali, teach us what the impact of media is on our children, of what they see. He says that the eye is the barid of the aql. Barid means postman. What does a postman do? He takes a message from the source and then he gives it to the destination. So the eye's job is to take a message from the source Okay, which in this case is going to be like Hollywood or Bollywood, right? And it's going, he's, that the, it's going to be conveyed to what? To our aql. Now, what is our aql? Our aql is the center of, in, in this case at least, a very simple understanding of it, um, is that it is the center of our thinking. All of us are gifted with this ability to be able to reason and to think about things in a rational way. But this ability to reason and think in a rational way can be influenced to make us make think in an irrational way, in a way that doesn't make sense. What are the factors that can make us think in a way that doesn't make sense? One of them is what we see. So here, Imam al Islam is teaching us that what you see um, affects the way you think. Now, the way you think affects the way that you make decisions, obviously, because when you want to make a decision, we think about it and then we make a decision. And when you make a decision, then we're going to act on it. So, basically, in summary for this hadith, what we see changes what we do. Right? There's, there's messages that are being conveyed to us through our eyes that's going to change what we do, and it's going to change what our children do as well. That's hadith number one. Now, we're going to look at two more hadith, and we're going to look at some examples. Hadith number two is this. Al-qalbu mushaful basar. This is reversed, but anyhow, it's supposed to be right to left. Anyway, the, the Imam is saying that the heart is the mushaf of the eye. Now, this is again a very, very instructional hadith. We're asking the question of Imam Ali, Oh Imam, what is the effect of media on our children? When they spend time in, on the phones, when they spend time in front of the screen, what's happening to them inside? Imam Ali says that what's happening is that a mushaf is being written for them. Now in Arabic there's a difference between the word kitab and the word mushaf. In English we translate both of them as book. All right? But in Arabic there's a, there's a difference and when our Imams speak, they speak very precisely. Mushaf is a complete manuscript from beginning to the end, cover the whole thing. That's a mushaf. Okay? A kitab can be a single page, it can be multiple pages, it can be a chapter, or it can be a whole document. But mushaf means complete, from the beginning to the end. What is the message that we're taking from our Imam al-Islam? We're taking that, that um, the, what the 
eye sees is captured into a book and that book is written into the hearts of the person who sees. Meaning now, now in the first hadith, Imam was talking about what happens to our power of thinking, how that gets influenced. In this hadith, the Imam is teaching us what happens to the way we feel about things. Now, what's more important? What we feel about something or what we think about something? You can ask yourself, when it comes to your children, how do they make their decisions? Do they make it based on what they think or what they feel? What do you guys think? What do you, what's, your, what's your feedback? What they feel, right? At the end of the day, there's sometimes when our children, like they really know, they really do know, but you know, like what they know kind of gets pushed aside. It's really what they feel, right? So Imam Islam teaching us is that what they see is going to affect what they do, basically. Again, and a third hadith, Okay, al uyunu tala'i'ul qulub. Tala'i' is the plural of tali'a, which means somebody who scouts ahead. You know, back in the days when they used to have, like, um, even today's, in today's world, when you have warfare, right, you have your army. Now, the army wants to move in a certain direction, it's going to send out its advanced scouts. They're going to go and survey the land, you know, look at where the where the weaknesses are in the enemy, find a strategy, and then come back and then direct the rest of the army and tell them that, okay, look at this is where you gotta go. Right? Imam Al Islam is teaching us something here. He's saying that there's something which pulls our hearts in a certain direction. The same way that the, the advanced scouts are gonna be, you know, guiding the army that you need to go there, don't go over there. There's something that guides our hearts and our center of emotions in that way as well, which is our eyes, what we see. What we see is going to pull us, pull our hearts in this direction or that direction. And again, what our hearts are, what we feel is how we make our decisions and how we are, what we actually become. So if you put these three together, all right, these two hadith put together, then the conclusion we're getting is that when it comes to what we think and when it comes to what we feel, all of these, the imams are teaching us that these are directly influenced by one factor, and that factor is what we see, what we behold. Okay, the, what, the time we spend in front of the screens. Now, as a parent um, who takes the imams as guides for life, right? Because that's what we, we believe that our imams are guides for how to live life, right? Including how I raise my children. Then this is a very, very strong message I'm getting from my imams. That I need to be very um, concerned about what is it that's going in because that's going to be very influential on what comes out in terms of the actual product that I have coming out from in, in the form of my children. So um, we have a responsibility here, which is that we need to make sure that what they see, what they intake um, is chosen very carefully. And we, help, we have a great responsibility when it comes to um, how we treat this issue of media and media exposure. So now what we're going to be looking at is we're going to see, look at some of the potential harms of media and we're going to also look at some um, examples as well. Now, the first harm um, is that whom are we sharing the upbringing of our children with? Okay, what I mean by this is that um, when, we, when it comes to raising our children, if we think that we're the ones who are raising our children, we're dreaming. Okay, because that's not, how it, that's not how it actually works, right? In today's world, it's not like back in the old days where, you know, our child was basically our product, right? Um, now we have much more con less control than we had in the past, and we're competing with a whole bunch of other competitors, right? And these competitors are very active, um, very attractive, okay, and um, very much involved with raising our children for us. Okay, they include the friends that they have. They include um, extended family members, right? There's sometimes we want our children to be in a certain way, but their cousins want them to be another way, and you know how it works, right? Um, there's daycares, right? There's schools, the school environment as well, very, very powerful. There's their teachers as well too. Um, the teachers do guide them, and they are role models for them, whether we like it or not. Um, and we're also competing with the media. Okay, now, with, so we need to understand all of these. We need to care about all of them as parents, right? All of them should be a concern for us, but this last one is the focus for today, which is the media. How, what kind of competitor is this? Is this somebody who is a, a good friend to have, a good partner to have? Is it, is it a good surrogate parent to have when it comes to raising our children? What is their motivation? You know, what kind of people are they? Who are they? All right, so let's look at that. Um, 
Well, before we get there, like, let's go through this actually. That, um, I just want to give a quote here. Malcolm X says that only a fool will let his enemy teach his children. Okay, so if we know that all those groups are teaching our children um, along with... Uh, Along with, um, along with us, right? Then we need to understand, are they our friends or are they our enemies? So let's go look at the media um, in particular. Now, this image right here, I know it's a bit hard to see, um, but basically what it's showing is that there are six... So back in 1983... Back in 1983, this is the number of, of companies that were um, media, media companies in the United States. Okay, there was, there was a number of them. Okay, in 2012, uh, there's six media giants that control 90% of all media. Okay, so I don't know why this isn't showing up properly on, on the screen here, but um, these six companies, like Comcast, News Corp, Disney, Viacom, uh, Time Warner, CBS, these own 90% of the content that, that our children and that we view as well. Um, in 1983, the same 90% was owned by 50 companies. Okay, so now it's six before it was 50. Um, any thoughts on this? What, do you, what are your thoughts? Like, what, what is the big deal? Why is this an important thing for us to be aware of? If it goes from 50 to six, is it really a big deal? Any thoughts? One mindset. One mindset. Okay. One mindset. Anybody else? Complete control. Okay. No breathing room. Right? One image, one message. All right? I read a statistic um, which was from the 2000, 2011 uh, elections for prime minister here in Canada. It's a very interesting one. It said that all newspapers in Canada that uh, endorsed a presidential candidate, sorry, a prime, a candidate for, all, all of them that wrote an editorial that endorsed a prime minister for 2011 elections, all of them chose... Stephen Harper in 2011, except for one newspaper in Toronto. Otherwise, every single one of them. And that, so, if you, and if you look at the proportion, it was three times the amount that the poll ratings were saying, meaning that somehow, like, there was a massive sort of like you know, um, you know, uh, effort to like come together and to endorse one candidate, right? So this is the type of thing. It's one voice that's that's basically controlling what we say and what we listen to. Now. Um, this is a, another way of looking at this data. In the United States, this is the thing. There's 1,500 newspapers, 1,100 magazines, stations, TV stations, publishers, all of them owned by six corporations. Okay, that's, that's a lot, right? Meaning that we're, we, we're deluded into thinking that there's different people who are talking to us. Now, in Canada, by the way, it's even worse. All right? Out of all the countries in the, in the, uh, the G8 countries, um, that country that has the most consolidation and like the most like unified message that's coming out from the companies is Canada. Eighty-one point four percent of um, of the uh, of the content is being controlled by a very small amount of companies. All right. Now there's some there's some uh, cartoonists who have sort of expressed what happens. You know, if this is the case. Unfortunately, again, so this basically there's a the, a bunch of garbage cans here. They're being poured into like our child's mind, right? And now it's just one garbage can. Okay, it's one uh, unified effort, right? Of they can choose what type of garbage to put in. Okay, or here's another one. Here you have um, you have this one like sort of megaphone, right? It says concentration of media ownership, and you have the puppy, okay? And the puppy represents the public, and it's like his master's voice, right? So now it's just one big loud, you know, controlled, unified sort of. Uh, push to um, to basically like you know dictate and to control the agenda in terms of what is being heard. Okay, so that's that's number one. Now number two is it, the harm. Number two, as when it comes to media exposure, that we need to be aware of is um, the that media can provide false answers to real needs. Um, when we when you look at uh, when you look at the writings of our ulama who have analyzed like what is a human being from the perspective of the Quran and the teaching of the Ahlul Bayt, they acknowledge that there are certain basic needs that a child has. That every human being has, actually. All right? One of them is a need for love and attention. All of us need to be loved. Okay? This, is, this is an intrinsic need that we have. We have a need to dispel energy. 
We have a, you know, we, have, we're get, we get active, right? We eat, we get energy, we need to dispel that energy. We, ha we have a need for socialization as well, to interact with other human beings on a social level. We have a need for variety and entertainment. Now, media comes along, and for each one of these, it gives its own response, its own version of satisfying that need. Okay, um, here, what I'm pointing out here is that there's some needs which become stronger at certain times in a human being's development. For example, the need to play is stronger in the first seven years. Okay. Now, in, me, in the media, we have answers to these. In the first one, when it comes to releasing energy, right, the media says that, okay, you want to release your energy? Okay, fine, come along, right, and you can watch other people do it. Right? If you think about it, you come, come watch other people. Come watch these sports figures, let them get that energy out, and you watch it. Right? Or you come and you press the buttons on your, your, you know, your controller and watch them like run around. Okay? It's a false solution to a real need because the real need is for you to get rid of the energy. Right? Not for them to get... But, but it does kind of address that need that we have. That's why we, we see get people getting excited about it. Another one is to be loved, escape into a virtual world. Okay, go play Minecraft or go play whatever like that and then chat with your beloved ones online. Right? And that need that you had to be loved by a real person, right? get it satisf satisfied in this world, in this way. Um, go chat with your friends, you know, go on social media and be loved in that way. Another one is that um, to feel like you will, we always need to belong. Right? So the way that you can belong is by adoring a celebrity, by, be, by joining the fan club, by admiring what the celebrity um, or this model does in their lives. That's somehow providing or meaning to provide this sort of answer to this need we have to belong. And then to satisfy the need for variety and entertainment, right, just come back to media and just change the channel. Right? View, view it from another perspective. Okay, now, when we, you know, we, we're rational people, right? we can see that okay, these are needs that we all have. Now, are, is this the way that, is this a system that Allah created that He wanted us to satisfy these needs with? Or was there something else that He intended other than these things? Right? Is media really the way that um, is going to give us the, the real answer to these? No, it's false answers to these needs. Now, what happened? What's the big deal? Okay, so my child needed to get energy dispelled. Instead, they went and they played um, FIFA for three hours in the afternoon. Okay, is, that, is there anything wrong with that? The answer is yes. Okay, there is something wrong with that. Right? When it comes to development of our children, it's very harmful. Okay, it's like trying to quench thirst with salt, wa salty water. Right? You know, when you're thirsty, okay, you're going to drink anything. You can drink salt water. Okay, fine. Drink salt water. What's going to happen to you? Right? You're going to get more thirsty, right? You're going to drink more, you're going to get more thirsty. And that's the way it is when it comes to media. And you know that. I mean, uh, different children have different levels of showing this, but you know, you, your experience with your children must have shown this, that the more they have, right, the more they want. Right? They, it's like there's something they just kind of like, they get trapped in, and like this, this sort of addiction. Okay, and, and it's been shown that the same type of brain sensors are triggered, um, that are triggered when it comes to addiction. Right? Social media um, video games trigger the same type of reaction in the body that addiction does. So, like if you get addicted to alcohol or something. Um, and the, the, the thing which is very dangerous is that it leads to a lack of desire to engage in alternatives. A child who gets used to dispelling energy on their video game console, right, and you tell, now you tell them after a year of that, that let's go to the playground. They'll be like, huh? <laughs> like, you'll figure out to do what? You want me to play on slides and monkey bars? You think I'm a monkey or something? You know, like, you know, you know how it is, right, when it comes to children, right? Um, or let's go to, you know, the, cons the con conservation area and have a picnic there, right? Mom, Dad, you know, come on. You know, like, you know th that's, unfortunately, that's the reality, right? That um, to wean them off of that and to give them the real solution to those real needs becomes more and more difficult. Um, and what happens is that we get blinded to the real solutions Allah has created for these needs. Right? We don't even realize it. Like, yes, okay, we, one thing that we need to kind of convince ourselves of is that there was a time in history where parents were able to raise their kids without devices. Right? Like there was, right? I mean, it, it was like most of history until recent times. Just in the last, like, you know, like few years that it became something which is a necessity. But there was a time. Now, how did they do it? Right? Is it really something which is so important for all of our children to have iPads and for, for them to be um, given uh, unreined access to this? Okay. Harm number three is that it provides, promotes anti-God agendas. This is something, again, that we need to understand that these people who are 
feeding our children these messages are not necessarily our friends. Okay, they have a different agenda. At the very least, at the very least, they want money, right? And they are that's their bottom line. They don't care about God. They don't care about halal and haram. They want money, right? Now, sometimes there might be the case that what they promote is something which is halal. Other times it's not. But at the end of the day, we have to understand that their motivation is something other than Allah. So what, kind, what, what is it that they're promoting? Right? This is something that we need to examine. I'm going to give you some examples now. Okay? Now, when looking at these examples, the, you might be saying that, oh, you know, brother, you're being very nitpicky. You're being very like conspiracy theory type of thing. I'm not. Okay? All I'm trying to do is give you, inshallah, try to uh, provide a perspective on how is it as parents we should be picky we should be watchful over what messaging is being conveyed by that postman, right, to our children. Okay, I'm going to look at some examples from um, from Disney. All right, first of all, like Little Mermaid, Frozen. Um, now, Little Mermaid. Here's the passage. Okay, that um, this is Ursula. I think that's her name is right. So she's she's. Uh, She's saying, here's the deal. I'm going to make you a potion that will turn you into a human being for three days. And then before the sun sets on the third day, you've got to get the dear old prince to fall in love with you. He has to kiss you. The kiss of love. If he does kiss you before the sun sets on the third day, you'll remain human permanently. But if he doesn't, you turn back into a mermaid and you belong to me. Now, have you ever thought about Little Mermaid as something which is encouraging the concept of slavery? Right? You probably haven't, right? Because it's a kid's show, right? But if you analyze this and you see what is she threatening her, uh, this girl with, right? You'd say, wait a minute. Is that something, you know, isn't that a pretty, like, mature theme? Okay, let's look at what she says over here. Okay, I need the volume high on this. Let's see. Do we? Oh, the, the volume's not going to work? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'll, I'll have to quote it for you then. Is it going to work on the computer? No, but it's not working on the computer. Oh, boy. Okay. Okay, so just to, in case you didn't see that, she says that don't underestimate the importance of body language. Okay, now... Um, don't underestimate the importance about just it's something to take note of that the the messaging that's being given to our children at a very young age is not necessarily something which is pure it's not something which is naive not something which is innocent don't underestimate the importance of of body language and then the type of you know sort of um, thing that she does at the end I don't know if you saw that but uh, um, it's something that I know I would not my, want my daughter being exposed to. That's not something which is a, something good for her to see. Okay, here's another one. Now, this is from the movie Aladdin. All right, by the way, how many of you have seen Aladdin? Like, okay, and how many of your children have seen Aladdin? Let me put it that way. Okay, well, I don't know. Okay, anyway, let's see. Okay, in case you missed it, um, what we had there was a picture of, of the genie who is a male figure right, in the movie Aladdin. He's a, he's a genie. And suddenly in this scene, he comes out and he sort of pops out of the, of the balcony dressed in women's underwear. Right? And he's like dancing with like the other uh, women there, like with, you know, fully equipped, right? Now, again, like these are small scenes, right? Small illusions, right? But a questioning mind would question, like, wait a minute, we thought he was a male figure. What are you doing wearing women's underwear? And you know, children, when it comes to these type of movies, they don't watch it just once. Okay, they watch it many, many, many times. And they, I mean, they can recreate the whole, <laughs> you know, the whole dialogue, everything that happens, right? Because they watch it so many times. All right, now, this is another example. Um, this is from a book series called Geronimo Stilton. How many of you have heard of this? Right now? Okay, so how many of your children like read this book? 
Okay, it's if you don't you know, right? You can like a, a lot of people, a lot of kids do, like a lot, like you know, from grade two, maybe as soon as they can start reading. This is one of the first books that they read now. Now, you might ask your children this question that okay, um, what type of book is it? And they'll be like, oh, it's perfectly good. It's just funny. It's like you know, just a comic. It's just comical. There's nothing wrong with it. I have I've asked my I've asked my students about this, um, and they're like, no, nothing's wrong with it. There's just um, this mouse and his sister, and they go through different adventures, and it's just funny. We, have, we enjoy reading it. But then I just went to the library like uh, yesterday, and I was just, you know, I wanted to see, right? And I came across this in Geronimo Sultan. This is, again, the first book that kids are reading once they can read. Okay, so um, it's a story about. This is in one of the books, right? It's a story about, about this, this mouse, Geronimo Stolten, who, um, who has a dream. Okay, and in this dream, he sees that he's having romantic dinner with this um, lady, girl mouse, lady mouse, and then, you know, basically he's fantasizing about her in his dreams. And then, on the next page, they have that picture of the two, like, smooching, right? I mean, they're, they're kissing each other, right? Now, Again, you're like, you might be like, okay, well, you know, what's the big deal, brother? Like, you know, like, th th come on, like, you know, this is what happens in real life. Okay, fine. It happens in real life. But as a first book for, my, for a grade two student, that they, they should be exposed to this type of thing, right? Um, and it's interesting how for many books, there's no mention of romance at all. And then suddenly in this book, it's all full of romance. It's like the Valentine edition version of, of like this, of the, of the Geronimo Stolten sort of um, series, right? Now, um, do we want to expose our children to, you know, the, the correct uh, perspective on, you know, um, gender interaction and all that? Yes, we do. But we want to be controlling that. We don't want them to teach them, especially this version of it. Um, it's very interesting. When I read this book, I was shocked. I mean, um, the, the whole plot of it is that the Mount Geronimo, he falls in love with this, um, this, this Stephanie. And then what he, he wants to find a way to make her love him. But she doesn't pay any attention to him. So he goes to a fortune teller, and then the fortune teller says that if you pay me like you know a couple hundred bucks, right, I'm gonna make it happen for you, right? So he's like, okay. So he gives her the money, and then she makes it happen for him. Now, if you just combine like all the messaging that's being given to our children, when you want to accomplish something, what is it that you need to do, right? When you want, when you have a haja, you have a need. Whom do you turn to 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 solve that need? It, it, I mean, it, at the very least, we have to be aware of what type of messaging is being given to our children. Okay, the next example I give is from Frozen. Okay, how many, uh, how, many, how many of your children have seen Frozen? Okay, how many of your children have seen it multiple times? Why is it that only the ladies answer, raise their hands? Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> they know it better. Okay, all right. Now, for, this is just one observer's uh, comments, right? She says that in the making of this movie, it is apparent that the very best talent within the industry was called upon. Um, and the goal was to woo its intended audience parents into a frozen state, which would then allow liberalism to indoctrinate children. This is somebody's opinion. Okay, now, let's see, let's see. Let's, let's look at some of the words and the messaging that's being given in this movie, okay? Here she is, all right? Now, she is, um, I think this is, her name is Elsa, right? So she's like, it's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. Okay, now just... Like, what perspective does that give versus the perspective of Inni Abdullah, right? I am a servant of Allah, right? Like, it's, from my perspective, it's night and day, right? I'm a servant of Allah. I'm looking to understand what the rules are. I want you to guide me, O oh Allah, and tell me what I should be doing versus that there is no right and wrong. It's really up to me, whatever I want to do, right? And it continues, right? I couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl. You always have to be. Conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. Well, now they know. Right? This is a direct translation of the concept of coming out of the closet. Right? I mean, there's really. I mean, there, this, there's nothing else. I mean, like this is what it means to come out of the closet. Okay. Now, when somebody's listening, okay, it continues. Right? Let it go. Let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go. Turn away, slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I am free. What happens now is that it's a very, very attractive melody, right? Extremely catching. One of the, apparently like the most like sort of catching song of recent times, right? 
um, there was a friend of ours, right, who, um, very, very good uh, lady, right, she, she was kind of like, um, you know, saying it as a point of pride. She's, she, she's a bilingual. She speaks both English and she speaks Persian as well. She's like, my daughter um, has memorized this frozen song and can sing it not only in English but in Persian as well, you know. So, alhamdulillah, okay, great. You know, now your child is like singing in English and Persian, singing it again and again. Now, do we think that even once that like maybe like that the messaging will somehow get through, right? That there is no right and there is no wrong. Let it be, I'm going to be free. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Okay? Um, anyway, we don't have to go there. Now, this is, this is from a book. It's called Stephanie's uh, Ponytail. All right, this, anybody familiar with this book? Yeah? Okay, Who, who's the author? Robert Munch. Robert Munch. Robert Munch is, uh, I didn't actually know about him before I moved to Canada, right? Or before, I guess my wife is Canadian, so maybe she told me it. But it wasn't something that I grew up with. But here, our children, you know, because he's a Canadian author, right? They really, like, do read Robert Munch, right? People think of him as funny, right? Okay, now, it's a story of Stephanie and her ponytail, right? Um, she wants, mom, mom says, that, okay, I'm going to put a ponytail on you, right? So she says that, um, would you like a ponytail? Come no, I don't want a ponytail. Then that's that, said her mom. That's the only place you can do ponytails. No, it's not. I want one coming out of the side above my ear. Very strange, said the mom. Are you sure that's what you want? Yes. So her mom st uh, gave Stephanie a nice ponytail coming out right above her ear. And when she goes to school the next day, the other kids see her and they say, ugly, ugly, very ugly. She says that it's my ponytail and I like it. Okay, notice the italics. All right, my ponytail and I like it. The next morning when Stephanie came to school, all the girls, even some of the boys, had nice ponytails coming out just above their ears. Okay, yeah, okay, it's funny, right? Aha, yeah, right, this is really creative, really funny. Okay, but what is the underlying ideology? What is it that's being promoted? Right, why is that in italics, right? Allah says in the Quran, Allah describes the biggest of the idols. The biggest of the idols, right? The most dangerous, um, the most vicious of idols in the Quran. What does he say? A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Ara'ayta man ittakhadha ilahahu hawa. Right, have you, let me tell you of the one who has taken himself or herself as his God. In those who take themselves and their opinion as being the decisive matter. Whatever I want, right? I, me, right? This is a, this is a, um, of course it didn't come out, the graphics didn't come out, but it says here, this is a, a picture I took from a public school in, in Canada, right? It was the first thing you see when you walk into the public school. I know where I'm going. I don't have to be what you want me to be. I want to be, I want to be what I want, Okay. What is the idea? The idea was one of like, it's up to me whatever I want to do, right? Now, you can ask yourself, right? I mean, is this an Islamic ideology, right? Why is it being pushed in so many different ways? Right? Just, I, I thought you find, might find this interesting. Just this morning, I, um, I, I just, I, I happened to look at one of the doors in, in, in the school, Islamic school, and it says that this isn't Burger King. You can't always have what you want, right? It made me very, very proud of, of, our, of the teacher, right? Like that. In, in Islamic school, right, it's not about what I want to do. It's about you, you. It's not about you, right? It's about what is right and what is wrong. Okay. Um, the next example of an anti-God theme I'm going to take is Grand Theft Auto. Okay, Grand Theft Auto is um, a video game, right? You go and you drive cars, right? But it's a lot more than just a video game, right? There's a lot more that stuff that happens there. This is from the reviews of that of that game, um, where there's a mother who who is talking about the type of things in that video and basically saying that um, the mini game and the strip club that's always there, right? And then you can turn it on, you can turn it off. Basically, she's saying that um, the majority of the swearing is in the cut scenes, which you should be able to trust your child to skip if you want them to. And the same goes for the lack of clothing, although it isn't shown very often, once or twice throughout the game. At the end, then, I don't think you should have any concerns about giving it to anyone over 13 since the language isn't any different and probably less frequent than what they would hear at school. Now, this game has a TV or MA, uh, MA rating, meaning that it's supposed to be for adults 18 and above. And these are non-Muslims who are saying this, right? That's why it really saddens me sometimes when I hear of Muslim children, right? Shia children being given free access to this type of game. And I hope it's not the case that we can agree with this type of ideology, which is that, oh, let, let us trust our kids, right? Is that how we do parenting, that we just trust our kids? From the very beginning, Right, like 
you know how it is when it comes to our kids, right? Do we just say, okay, um, just here's the keys to the house, right? You do your own thing, I'm going to do my own thing, right? As parents, we don't do that, right? We're careful to make sure that, you know, that God forbid that they should do something which is dangerous to their physical health. Same thing when it comes to their spiritual health as well. Um, now, this is something which, um, it's a big deal, okay? Like, according to statistics, Yeah, um, 70% of all 8 to 18 year olds boys have played it and 85% of 15 to 18 year olds, all right? So there's a very, very good chance that every single child, right, will be playing this game, all right? It's not, it's something which, that was in 2010, right? Now it's even more prevalent, like meaning that it's something which is almost like impossible to avoid um, when children go and, you know, they go to other people's homes, at home, whatever it may be. Okay. The harm number four is promotion of negative behavior, all right? So what I want to give here is examples of violence, swearing, and fear as well. Now, the first one is violence. Now, as an example for this, I want to again give um, the game Grand Theft Auto, right? This is a scene from that game which says that hold, uh, you know, this button to grip with the left clip and that one to grip with the right clip and press this button to spark the clips. Now, what's happening here is that they're torturing this person right here. Okay, now this is the type of violence which is being um, given to children. Okay, um, and here um, they describe like the scene um, where, when, where it comes to the language that's being used um, in that scene and it's talking about you know, the different words that um, are being said in that as well too and different content and those type of things. Okay, now what, this is sometimes uh, you know, an excuse that we hear from the children which is that, okay, look it, I'm... It's just language and it's just violence, right? It's kind of like as if it's not a big deal. It doesn't really affect me. Um, actually, uh, that's not correct because, again, going back to the premise, what we see determines who we are, okay? Um, this is just interesting stats about violence in TV, okay? The number of murders seen on TV by the time an average children finishes elementary school, 8,000. Violent acts that they see on TV, 200,000. Percentage of Americans who believe TV violence helps Precipitate real life mayhem, 79, right? And then the number of minutes per week that parents spend in meaningful conversation with their children, 3.5, all right? Um, there's a lot of research that's been done on this topic of violence. Um, if you look and see what is the overall sort of, um, what is it that's happening when people are exposed to violence repeat repeatedly, is that, number one, it, it destroys the innocence of children. Okay, children naturally have innocence they're not okay with violence they're upset by it but when you show it to them and you expose it to them repeatedly then it destroys that innocence it leads to attraction and then even imitation as well of that violence it distinguishes it dis diminishes the sanctity of human life and the horror of harming it and it leads to a violent response to life what i mean by the violent response is that we as human beings are taught that you know as part of our uh, system of akhlaq is that if we're provoked if we're irritated then we need to respond with patience, right? With hilm, right? If somebody comes to you and, you know, they start arguing with you, like the example of our imams is what? You know, is that they would respond with kindness. Itfa billati hiya ahsan, as the Quran says. But when somebody's playing a video game, like what they get trained to do is to respond to aggression with more aggression, right? You punch me, I'm going to come and I'm going to punch you there and punch you here as well too. Right? Or I'm going to shoot you, or I'm going to kick you, whatever it is. Right? That type of violent reaction is something which is directly um, opposed to what our system of akhlaq teaches us. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. So, uh, th 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 there was a very interesting study done about fear and horror in movies. Okay, now, I want you to just think about this. Like, when you were a child, right, did you ever see any horror movies that the effect of which stayed with you right anybody anybody know like anybody want to mention what movie did you watch when you were a kid where it was something that kind of maybe kept you up at night or that you know got into your dreams any any movies yeah jurassic park, jurassic park. okay any others right bollywood movies <laughs> okay all right what about jaws anybody seen when they were like like jaws right remember the jaws right all right, I'll, I'll tell you from my own experience, right? 
um, when I was a kid, I walked into, um, like, I don't know who it was. Like, there were some adults who were watching a James Bond movie. Okay, now, in this James Bond movie, there was, like, he was sleeping on the bed, and there was, like, an assassin who was, like, on the ceiling, who was, like, kind of going along the ceiling and had poison. I don't know if it was a lady or a man assassin, but they had poison in a vial. And then they were trying to aim it so that when, you know, he's sleeping, that he would be turned this way, that they would drop the poison and would go right into the mouth of James Bond, right? Now, some of you might have actually seen that before, right? After I saw that, for at least one year, I was terrified to go to sleep, okay? I'm just going to my personal experience, all right? Now, I was, I was kind of curious about this, right? Like, that, that is this, am, I, am I just weird? Like, you know, is this something with me, right? And then I found that there was a lady... Um, Allahu Akbar Allah. Okay, there was a lady, uh, her name is Cantor. Okay, she's, she's done research particularly on the effect of the Jaws movie. Like, it was such a profound effect in, like, the society that she actually did, like, a specific study of what kind of effect it have on people, right? They, she did a very interesting thing at the university where she had students fill out a survey about whether... Um, you know, they've ever seen a, a scene in a movie like that which kind of like affected them. And basically, I'll just sum, summarize the conclusion. She said that 90% um, of the respondents of that survey said that they have had uh, scenes that have frightened or disturbed them so much that the emotional effect endured after the program or the movie was over. And of these, then... Um, 35% said that the effects lasted more than a year, and 26% said that they were still with them at the time of the survey, which was about six years after. Meaning that it's a very common thing that when we see scenes of violence um, or like scary scenes in a movie, that it does affect us, right? Now, again, we have a responsibility towards our children, um, and we need to protect them from these types of things. Okay, the other um, harm when it comes to when it comes to um, media is that it can distract us from what's important. Okay, there's a lot of uh, distraction when it comes to media. Right? A lot of times when you know, our children are just engaged and busy in doing something. But the question is that, is this the purpose for, for what they've been created for? Is this what, how they're supposed to spend their time? Right? Um, look at this tradition from Imam Ali salam. He says that every glance in which there is no learning or contemplation, it's something which is lahu. Right? Again, the words of the Imam Islam are very powerful. They're very deep. What is, in, in the Arabic language, what is something that is lahu? It's something that makes you occupied and distracts you from something else. That something else is something which is more important than this distraction. And that distraction is done in a subconscious way. Meaning that the effect of media is that it takes, according to Imam Islam, is that it takes our children away from the path that they're supposed to be walking on and diverts them to another path. Okay. Now, what's an example of this? All right, Minecraft. Now, I'm not saying Minecraft is something which is like you know haram. Right? Don't get me wrong. Right? I'm just giving an example. We have YouTube channels which are set up where they record uh, somebody playing Minecraft. Okay. Now, of, of all the types of distractions that you could come up with, like it's one thing to play the game, right? But now you have like children who spend hours and hours watching other people play the games. Let me sit back and watch this other kid like play the game, right? I, subhanallah, like you know, like the the way that they've been able to come up with the system to basically you know like capture the the attention of, of our children, right? Other other examples of this lahu, right? You have U uh, YouTube channels in general, right? You have this um, lady called Superwoman. Okay, I don't really know too much about her, right? But if you just look at the types of of episodes, right? What is it that she talks about, and why is it? Why you know this is one of the most like she's more watched than like you know all the famous like actors and actresses that you can come up with, right? Like kids, they follow every single episode that she puts out, right? But what is she busy with them? What sort of topics does she discuss, right? How can this be something which is useful for um, our children? Okay, the other harm is th that it over exercises the power of imagination. Um, it's good. It's good to be a creative person, good to be an imaginative person. But according to um, our Islamic teachings, that there is a purpose for our imagination, which is to help us understand reality. Okay, why is it that Allah makes use of stories in the Qur'an? Why does He make use of parables in the Qur'an? It's not just so that we can have a good story, right? It's order, in order to teach us about reality. Right? When it comes to our children, 
And this idea of giving them, exercising their imagination, be creative, fantasize, right? Think about things, right? We have to ask ourselves, well, what is the purpose of that? Is it just, like, just so that they can, like, spend their time, just so that they can feel happy? No, there has to be some purpose behind it, which is that I want my son and my daughter, right, to understand more about reality by means of fiction, right? So what, what that means is that fiction and imagination is supposed to be used as a means, not as an end in and of itself, okay? The problem is that in today's world of media, right, um, with fantasy and science fiction and all that, right, it gets to a point where it becomes a thing on its own, right? Where we have children who, like half of their waking day is lived in a world which is not this world right here. You know, why is it that we have this problem with like children um, not being mature enough to get married, right? Uh, like even, it's really sad. Some, like you have people who are graduating from university and they're not ready to get married, right? And then you know how many problems that causes like in our, in our societies, right? Or we have so many examples of people who try to get married young because they heard the ulama say, okay, the prophet said that you should get married when you're young. So they get married when they're young and then the marriage gets broken up, right? Why is that? It's because they're not mature enough, right? They weren't ready for it. Why are they not mature enough? Because they're living in fantasy land, right? They're, they think of this world as being some just, you know, like a place where whenever you have a problem, you have to pick up your wand and wave it and say a spell and then you can get your problem solved, right? That's not reality. So this is something we have to be careful about. That what is the role of imagination? How much do we want to um, have our children be engaging in it? If it's over-exercised, it can actually be harmful. Okay, the, the remaining portion of the presentation has to do with specific recommendations, right? Um, now that we have, inshallah, you know, we've gotten a chance to think about this, right? What is it our children are viewing? What are some specific steps that we can take to, in, with respect to watching media and also some alternatives as well? Um, I do want to take a break right here, though, um, because um, I just need uh, a few minutes of, of a break. Um, I think that this first part of the, it, the session goes until 12... 30, I believe, is that right? 12.10? Okay, 12.10. Okay, so, um, okay, just inshallah, and in, in, we'll take a few minutes break, inshallah, maybe about 11.45, we can start up again then. Okay? Please say salawat ala Muhammad. Ala Muhammad. Okay, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, <clears throat> The, um, the rest of this presentation is focused on some practical uh, steps and recommendations for those parents who would be concerned and would want to find out thank you um, what are some Islamic strategies for um, you know for dealing with this issue of media now these are these are suggestions you know on the basis of the teachings of, of the ulama um, of strategies they can take but at the end of the day um, when it comes to Parents, parenting, you know, parenting, it's not a, there's no like sort of a guide which says that, okay, you need to do exactly step one, step two, step three, and that's it, right? The way that Islamic parenting works is that you're given some principles, right? You've all, you're also given the ability to like think and to observe. So as parents, what we need to do is we need to understand the guiding principles, understand where our children are at, and then apply the principles in the correct way. So it might be the case that for you know, that um, for even though these are recommendations which, generally speaking, will be effective and work, it's not going to, we're not guaranteeing that they'll work in every circumstance because there could be some unique sort of situations that are applicable in, you know, some child's case. Okay, so number one, session number one is to spend time with children, okay? Um, there is no substitute for a parent um, to spend time with their children. Like, it's not, it's not okay to think that as a parent, um, I can not spend time with, with my children and let media spend time with them and everything's gonna be okay at the end of the day, right? The, this, the one-on-one -on -one time um, that we have with our children is extremely, extremely essential and extremely powerful um, and in the long run, that is what is going to help us um, win this battle over those competing ideologies, right? Um, in fact, trying to replace it with something else is gonna backfire because what happens then, as I mentioned before, is that our children get used to um, using media as like their friend or their their friends or whatever it is, right? And they don't want us anymore, right? Like I, I have examples of parents who, um, you know, their children have now hit their teenage years and when they try to spend time with them now because they made a mistake when it was earlier, their children kind of react in a negative way and 
they know it's not a natural thing. It's very unnatural for them to spend time with each other. We have to ask ourselves, what is it that prevents us from spending more time with our children? Right? Like, honestly, like we have to be honest with ourselves, right? And if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we'll actually realize, like, for some of us, right? Some of us who are unfortunately not, you know, like, performing our duty, like, I'm speaking for myself um, first and foremost, we realize that actually sometimes it comes from a lack of desire to do so, right? Because in the, today's generation, we also, um, we also have been kind of swept away with this whole current, right? We're more comfortable. It's, more e- it's easier for us to also sit back and watch TV than it is to play with our children. Right? I speak to my, my fellow fathers in particular right here. Like after coming back home from a hard day at work, okay, <laughs> you know how it is, right? Like what do you want to do? Right? You want to get, you know, play blocks with your kids? You want to like, you know, play sports with them? No, you want to like kick back, you know, eat dinner, and then just chill, right? Like, you know, to spend, now to like spend time with the children, it's very hard, right? On the weekends, we have so many things going on, majalis and like majalis and majalis and invitations to people's home and then majalis and like so many things, right? That it's like, um, you know, when do we have time to actually spend time with our children? Right? But the reality of it is that, is that we, we must do so. Like if you look at the, the lives of our great ulama, um, one of the things that you'll see in their lives is specific time that they set aside to spend time with their kids. And at that time, it's just them and their kids. Like Shahid Bahishti, uh, Rahmatullahi uh, Alayh, you know, he was involved in establishing the Islamic uh, a government, Islamic government. Like he, he was like one of the main um, people who was responsible for setting up a whole government of a country. Okay. But he was a very busy person, right? One time one of his like aides calls him, very important issue to discuss, right? He says, Assalamu alaikum, like, Assalam, you know, I, I, I need to discuss this thing with you, sorry to bother you. He's like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm spending time with my daughter working on her homework. Click, and he puts the phone down. Right? This, is, this is my time with my daughter, right? Um, Allah Matawatawai's daughter, Rahmatullahi like she says that um, my father will be busy working on his tafsir, right? He worked for years and years on tafsir al-mizan, right? I mean, t- in today's world, for something like that to be produced, first of all, it, it can't be produced. I mean, it's, I mean, it's very hard to, to imagine that it's something which is unique, okay? But in, if something like that is going to be produced, it's produced by a whole team of people. He did it all by himself, right? That's how he was, he was very busy. He said my, she said that my father would spend time writing his stuff, so writing his stuff, here, but every day there would be a time when he would spend time with us, right? There, this was our time with him. That's something that we need to, to learn from, right? Um, and just like if we find that sort of initial hesitance to do so, um, inshallah we'll find that after time, after, after doing it a few times, you know, working on it, then um, we'll suddenly realize that, you know, the same way that Allah created us with the ability to have children, He also created us with the ability to play with our children as well. Right? It's something which comes from God. We don't have to worry about it. It's not something that we need to like, read a book on or take a class on, right? I'm going to play with my kids. Okay, how do I play with them? Just, just be a kid. Just play, you know, tasabu. Like uh, the, the, the Prophet says that when you're with the kids, be like a kid. Okay? It's something that we just need to try. We do, and inshallah, right? Again, if it's been some time, it might take a while for it to like, become natural. But after that, we'll see that it's something which we, are, we have the ability from Allah to do so. Um, children have a natural need to play. Okay, in um, we see the Ahlul Bayt al-Muslim like playing with. This is a topic of discussion. Actually, it could be a whole seminar on what are the techniques that the Ahlul Bayt use to play with their children. It's very interesting. We have so many traditions on this. Um, but one of the things we can learn from that is that for our children to be able to play at home is very important. Okay, to have an environment where they can play, even if we have to invest in that environment. Right? Like one of the things that you know you can inshallah think about, right, is this that that even the place that we're living in, right? If I need to move a little bit further away, uh, but I can get a place which has room for my children to play in, right, isn't that better than them being like cooped up in a place where they can't play? Right? Like these, especially in, in Toronto where we can have basements. In some places in the in other parts of North America, you can't even have basements. It doesn't work. Here you have basements. Why not get a place where you have a big basement where the kids can like thro- throw around a ball? Because for four months of the year, it's too cold to go outside. Okay? But um, basically having an environment where the children feel like, okay, I'm, when I'm at home, I can go play. It's not just the default is media, 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 screen time, screen time, screen time. No. Um, another thing that we need to also uh, be promoting is the, po- the culture of positive reading. Okay, where our children 
um, see reading as something which is very good and um, very attractive. Now, of course, not reading just anything, reading things which are good and wholesome, right? Um, but reading on the whole lacks some of those harms that screens have with them. Now, as parents, we need to be very aware of this, right? These days, you find a lot of push for like making everything into a screen. Like even in some of the schools, right? Like the reading at a very young age is done on the iPad, right? There's like reading programs that you go through at home. You have to read from the iPad, right? But any parent knows, again, right? What is the effect of just giving a screen to a child? Right? And then sometimes you hear about the horrors of what happens when the child clicks on certain things, right? When they're not supposed to click on them, and then what happens at a very how they get damaged at a very young age. Um, one of the, the scholars who's done a lot of work in this area of, of tarbiyah, um, his name is Ustad Abbasi. Um, he's, current, he's a current scholar in Iran. He's an expert in this area. He says that reading is a competitor to negative media. However much a family becomes more tuned to media, they will distance themselves from the culture of reading. The more they read, the less media they will use. Okay. Um, one of the people who's really um, promoted uh, this culture of reading is uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. Hafidahullah, um, he, okay, so it's going to be the next slide after, uh, here it is, okay, so he, he says that it's necessary to promote book reading in a society, I believe one of the worst and more har most harmful kinds of laziness is the lack of energy to read books, then he says that certain people are used to reading books, but books that do not require thinking. Nothing's wrong with this. After all, this is a kind of reading. I would not deny this, but it is better to combine recreational reading, like reading novels, autobiographies, and easy historical books with reading serious books, books that require thinking and careful study. Okay, now, speaking from experience, right, um, children do like fiction books, all right? But they don't, ha they, they like fiction books, they, but they'll like any fiction books, as long as from the beginning, right, you are involved with that process, you choose interesting books, that are appealing to them, right, but that lack the negative messaging. The other thing you'll see is that if you go to the library and you bring some fiction and some nonfiction, if you choose the right nonfiction and you train your children at a young age to do this, they will also be interested in nonfiction as well. Like there's certain books, especially now, which are, which are made, which are incredibly attractive for, um, for young children. I'll give you an example. Like my children uh, last year, they participated in the science fair where the theme was about outer space. Okay, now for a whole year, right, they have just been fascinated with like, books to do with space, right? Anything about space, different spacecraft, different planets, whatever it is. Um, my son, in his, one of his classes, he was given an assignment about like, um, something to do with like, facts and figures, right? Now he's fascinated with almanacs, right, where they give like, interesting facts for kids. Like things like, I don't know, like if you, do you know that if you eat enough, or, uh, enough carrots, then your skin will turn orange? I remember for, like, he was like, very fascinated by that fact, right? So they, they do a really good job these days of coming up with like interesting nonfiction books for our children, which actually expand their horizon and their points of discussion. Like, you know, the, the, my kids, like, they'll be reading that and they'll be very keen on like, sharing what they learned then, like about these like, facts and figures. Um, so what we need to do is we need to invest um, in reading. Um, we need to choose reading material uh, carefully. Now, um, even to the point of this, like where... If we can have a shelf which is dedicated for, um, for our books, for our children. Like, it's one thing to go to the library and check out good books. That's fine. But one of the other suggestions is to also have books that your children own. Right? Because there's a special sort of like pride that comes with like owning books. And then even have a nice shelf on a bookshelf or even a whole bookshelf that is your child's bookshelf. Right? The, you'll see that there's a certain sort of pride that they take with that. And then those books which you find like, have a very good messaging, you can actually buy those as well and invest in this as well. Um, I've, I've offered this advice to parents and um, like just speaking from experience, anecdotal experience, like it does seem that it has an impact. You know? So this is a suggestion I'm offering to, to you um, parents as well. Um, the thing about books is that they're a lot easier to filter than media, okay? because you can go through it, right? Um, and there's a lot of um, you know, resources available to help you go through it and to identify what is the negative messaging. I'm going to give some of those resources, inshallah, in just a couple of minutes. Um, we have to be careful, though. Like I said, I give you some examples of books from before. 
Some of the most popular books that our children read are filled with negative messaging. Um, especially like the books that are written, that are being written like in current times. Um, I'll give you an example of Di Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Um, how many of you have heard of this series? Okay, so it's very, it's very common. Okay, if you go to the library, it's very common. Now there's one book in that series that I've gone through. It talks about things like, you know, going to a, 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 a party and then doing spin the bottle at the party, where you spin the bottle and then you know, the, 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 the opposite gender person who's facing the bottle, you have to like then, you know, um, have a relationship with them, right? Um, it talks about things like uh, putting up fake pictures on social media of you and uh, you know, playing beach volleyball with like, the opposite gender. It talks about fantasizing about having parties with like, you know, the opposite gender and these sorts of themes right, of jumping into like, their sleeping bags. And you know, this is the type of stuff which you know, grade three, um, grade four, grade five, grade six, like, it's very common for them to be reading this. And I find this is something that which just shocks me that I, there are parents right, who they read maybe one of them and they're like, oh, this is cute, right? It's interesting. And then they'll buy, Shia parents, Muslim parents, they'll buy the whole set for their kids, right? Um, not realizing that our children read this with incredible interest and attention, right? They, 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 they soak these messages in. And when it comes to this type of sensitive material about social interaction, social media interaction with the opposite gender and parties and those type of things, I don't know about you, um, I mean, but we, I, I, speaking as a parent, right? Of course, we all would. We wouldn't be the controlling that message. We want to be teaching our children what is the right way of approaching that. Um, we don't want the author of this diary to be teaching our children how it is that um, our children should be interacting with the opposite gender. Um, reading time. Um, one of the suggestions that's given by the ulama is to have times for the entire family to read. Let's everyone come together and have reading time. Right? We do different things as a family. One of the things that we do is that we have reading time. Everyone picks up a book and reads. Um, reading to children at bedtime as well. Um, it's something which children can grow to love, like really, really like they look forward to that. Um, last uh, sort of piece of advice is to have controlled exposure, okay? Is that we, when it comes to the dunya in general, um, and when it comes to media in particular, we have to be in control, right? We shouldn't let the dunya come and take us for a ride, right? We shouldn't let the media come and take us for a ride. We have to control that. Um, we, we need to be in control. I, there is no need for our children to own devices. No need at all. Okay, this is a false statement that our children will be left behind in terms of technology if they, are not, if they don't have their own device. All right? Um, I'm, I'm, I come from a tech background. Right? I'm aware of like, you know, like devices and all that. Um, it's not something which is a requirement. When you look at the potential benefits of them having their own device versus the harms, the harms far out outweigh the benefits. There are other ways of teaching them those things. Um, if they need to use devices, let it be in a public um, forum. Okay, I know that we love our children. I know that we like to think very high of them. I know that we like to trust them. But having this type of trust where we give them um, a tool which is like a very, very effective tool of the shaitan, Right? And base, tell them that go take it in your room and do whatever you want with it. That's not an effective tarbiyah strategy. Right? It's asking for uh, disastrous consequences. Um, the Islamic approach towards tarbiyah is prevention before cure. Right? Meaning that we need to take, to take the necessary precautions to avoid giving them that type of access. Um, there has to be particular uh, care when it comes to using search engines and YouTube. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times that my children have searched for things like innocent things. like. Like if you search for, and, and they, come, it, they see like negative things. You search for Caillou. Caillou is like a, a kid's show. Um, if you search for it on YouTube, you'll see that there's, there's spoofs done on Caillou where they, they show all this horrible like violence and like, you know, all these other sort of things. Right? Now imagine like when one of our children thinks they're watching Caillou cartoon and then they click on one of those things, right? What, what are they going to see? Um, even other sort of cartoons and those type of things, it, Sometimes you'll be searching for it, and then the stuff that comes up on the side is very horrible um, types of messaging and, and horrible themes. Um, aside from the spiritual effects, right, there's even worldly effects. This is from a very interesting 2010 um, study that was done. Um, it shows how, unfortunately, the, the thing doesn't show, but basically, um, over here, it, it shows if, when somebody is a heavy, when, when a child is a heavy user of the media, uh, you have
you have 51% um, of, of heavy users of media have good grades. But when they're light users, they have 65%. Um, when they have heavy users of media, there's 47% who have poor grades, and then 23%, if they use it lightly, have poor grades. Okay, so it's been shown statistically that there, I mean, again, these type of statistics are tough to see, right? Because it could be when a correlation, it could, you know, it, it's just saying, that it's suggesting that there's a correlation between when you have less media usage and then higher grades, okay? Even when it comes to other things, like um, this one right here. Heavy media users, uh, they have roughly a, they have a 20% low level, 20% of them report a low level of, of contentment, okay? On the other hand, light media users, they report a 10% level of low, low personal contentment and 22% of high personal contentment. So the gist of this is that if you look at the light and the heavy, it's opposite to statistics, statistics, meaning that those who use media less, they're the ones who are happy, and those who use media more, they're the ones who are not happy. Right? Again, these are just statistics, right? Um, and this is what is correlating the type of things that we've learned from our imams and the principles that, of, of tarbiyah that they're teaching us, right? That even the, the academics, the emotional state of our children is, seems to be affected by the media when it comes to these type of studies. You see that as well. Um, okay, um, just the last two slides, right, is that when it comes to media, like one of the things I would suggest to parents is to resist social pressure. Right? If everyone else right, is giving their children a, an iPhone, giving them an iPad, right, it doesn't mean anything when it comes to what I have to do. Right? Since when is following the majority a standard for what we do, especially followers of the Ahlul Bayt right? We pride ourselves on doing what's right, right no matter what. Okay? So we can't cave in. Okay, all, everyone in public school has, a, has an iPad. So what? Okay? Doesn't mean I have to, my children have an iPad. Okay? Um, the other thing is to be two steps ahead of our children. We need to be very aware of the technology that they're using. If they're using Snapchat, we should understand everything about Snapchat before. That. If they're using Minecraft, we should understand Minecraft. Right? We should be there and along the way, and they'll appreciate that, um, and also be aware of, of being aware of what's going on. Um, watching and playing with, with our children, right? this is something which is a very effective techniques. Um, okay, they want to play a new game? Okay, let's, let's play it, let's play it together. And then choosing peer groups wisely. Um, the thing which will influence, influence our children's media intake more than anything else is what their friends are watching. Okay, this is very important. Uh, my advice to parents is that even if it means redefining who our friends are, who our close friends are, who we, who we spend time with, whose houses we go to, who we go um, camping with, right? Um, even if it means redefining that and finding new friends, it's worth it when it comes to our kids. We need to be close with people who have the same goals and the same policies when it comes to media. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? Because my child is going to hear from his friend that they went to like the opening thing of this movie, right? And that movie, and then they, have, they watch this at Netflix at home, and they have this type of devices and these type of games. Now, obviously, if I deprive the, my children of that, they're going to feel left out. They're going to be always hearing about it from their cousins or their friends, right? So I need to choose my peer groups wisely. Um, last thing I would just give is some... Um, suggested resources. One of them is, if you, if, you t if you go on this link right here, there's a document, it's a work in progress of some suggested media and books for children. Um, if you'd like to take a look at that, then um, it's a resource for you. Um, the other one is the Ikra Book Club. It's something that we've um, started at Wali al Asr schools, uh, Wali al Asr school, which is um, an alternative to the scholastic uh, reading. Um, it's called Ikra reading. And basically, um, according to certain criteria that we've established, um, we have a team of people who go through and try to find books for children, uh, both Islamic books and then even books written by non-Muslims, you know, fiction books, but that are, that are safe, that are sound for our children. And this is something that we've opened up to, to anybody, even those who are outside of the school as well, to, to participate in. Um, you can even just get the names of those books as well and look at them as a possible you know, thing for your children to read. Um, the other resource that I would mention is a website. It's called Common Sense Media. Um, it's a very good website where they'll go through and they'll have parents review different media. And they'll be looking for certain things like violence and um, suggestive themes and uh, sexuality and um, you know, gore and these type of things. And they'll actually tell you what's wrong with a movie. 
um, when it comes to those things, all right? Um, so it's a good idea to look at that, and you can kind of preview media with that. But, but my advice to you is that don't just rely on that, because they're looking for these, these things, right? But they're not looking at like, the themes, the ideology. That's something that you have to be in charge of. You have to be looking for Like on Frozen, if you notice the examples we gave weren't about you know, those type of things. It was about the ideology of individualism that was being pushed to um, the person who was watching it. We ask Allah Ta'ala um, to accept uh, these efforts to, to guide us um, to the best way of raising our children in a way that is pleasing to the Imam of our time. Um, inshallah, uh, I pray that um, this is something which has been um, you know, a beneficial experience for everyone. Um, there'll be an opportunity, inshallah, to ask questions, share your feedback um, later on. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi tahirin. There are, have been some questions that were written down on the paper, uh, on the on the cue cards. There's still the cue cards available if you want to add any question. Um, there's also mics are available in the um, if somebody wants to ask it live. So there's been a lot of requests, a number of requests for the the presentation itself. So. The management uh, of the madrasa has that, and they also have recorded this as well. Um, so they are going to make it available to you. Inshallah, you can take it from them. Those of you who gave me your email address, um, I would just ask you to please direct your request to, to the management and get the file from them if you want to get a copy of the presentation, um, rather than my uh, emailing it to you. There's also some requests for my email address. Um, my email address is um, my last name, Yusuf Ali, Why you? S-U-F-A-L-I and then the at sign and then um, let me give you my Gmail address it's my last name Yusuf Ali Y-U-S-U-F-A-L-I 789 not 786 so Yusuf Ali 789 at gmail.com so Yusuf Ali Y-U-S-U-F-A-L-I 789 at gmail.com but I just want to say um, to those of our sisters who asked for it that um, uh, I tend to get like a lot of email and my time is very limited um, so for personal uh, counseling and personal queries if you put them on email unfortunately I just I really have very very limited amount of time to be able to answer um, like personal like requests and detailed personal situations for, so for those um, you know maybe if there's a number of them a number of the ladies who would want that um, then maybe we could set up another session where I could come here for example and then we could just set up time to have one-on-one -on -one meetings um, but for to do it all over email, I just I really unfortunately don't have the time to be able to do that. Um, so I just ask that something else be set up. Maybe you can co coordinate with the management of the madrasa to set up some other type of form for that. Okay. Um, what about the uh, the curriculum that has been imposed in public schools? How do we avoid kids avoid learning, especially at a very small age? Um, this is a very serious issue uh, in public school. Um, th those of us, those of the parents who are choosing to send their children to the public school, um, they need to do so with awareness, with full awareness of what is it that's happening there um, and what is it that their kids are being exposed to. Um, one of them is the curriculum, but that's one among a number of different things that are taking place there. Just, yes, just two days ago or three days ago, I, I was meeting with some students who are telling me about the public school experiences, they were saying that it, it, the, the problems that they have to face, the challenges they have to face, go beyond just curriculum. Um, they were saying, for example, that they have to play a game where you have to trust in, like basically you, you go around and you're in a circle, you have to trust in the person you're going to fall back. You're going to fall back and you're going to be caught by somebody. You need to trust the person you're going to fall back into. Right? So they're saying that like, there's no issues of, they don't, the teachers don't tell us about boys and girls. Just, you just trust that whoever it is and then you're going to fall into their hands. Um, or they talk about this, uh, that one, one girl was saying that when we go on field trips, like, they tell us that we have to sit with guys. You know, so I have to actually, like, you know, every time I have to tell the teacher that now I want to sit with a girl, I have to trade partners. So there's, there's a lot of issues. I mean, um, the, the curriculum is, just, those, the, the sex ed curriculum is just part of the difficulties that our children have to face in public school. Um, there are other issues as well, too. So. Um, we need to be aware of that. We need to be fully aware of what is it that our children are, are being taught. Um, we need to read the books that they're reading um, and then uh, to point out those passages and those messages and those themes which are contrary to our deen. Um, if you think that, uh, if you, my brothers and sisters think that the way to counter negative messaging is 
to send our kids to Sunday school, um, and that's going to be enough. Unfortunately, um, I want to be frank and tell you that you're wrong, um, because whatever they learn in English class in school is much more powerful than what they're going to learn in, in Sunday school on Sunday. There's no question. Like your children are being taught um, an ideology through their English programs, right? I mean, there, there's no there, like we have to we have to come to terms with this reality, right? They're being taught a way of thinking, a, taught, a way of approaching this through stories, through storytelling, through movies, um, through media exposure that they're going to give in the schools, right? So you have to be involved with that. You have to be aware of what is it that they're in the intake and what is it that the, that's, uh, that that is going to result, and you need to be discussing with them at every point, teaching them and training them um, to distinguish be between what is right and what is wrong. Um, and it, it becomes difficult when they're at a very small age to ask them to do some of the challenges, right? So uh, my, my advice to you is to see what you can do to pull them out, to give them alternatives, to, to find alternative environments um, as much as possible. Um, one of the sisters says that I'm a single mom. Um, I don't have any other help. Um, my kids are exposed to Canadian society more time in a day. How do I spend more time with my kids? I work nine to five. Um, they, they need my attention. Uh, my, my heart goes out to the sister who asked that question. I really do feel for your situation. Um, it is very difficult because, um, you know, to not to, to be forced to have to choose between um, spending time with your children who need that time and between um, having to, like, earn an income, which, of course, is something which you need to do in order for your children's, like, survival. Um, but see what you can do um, to... Uh, make sure that your children are in good hands. Whenever you do send them to some place, you know, if it's an after-school program, try to make it a program which is managed by Muslims, right? Um, try to find good friends for your children. Um, tr see what you can do if you can um, to um, involve them with like you know other groups or other um, venues and forums where they have more time with people who um, they can relate to and, and come from the same basis. Um, in, in the Islamic teachings, what we're told is that our close friends should be people who have iman, right? I mean, there is no, in, the, the, with, with all, the, all the emphasis that Islam has about being respectful to others, being kind to others, um, you know, to, having tolerance, all that in its place, all that is necessary. But when it comes to close friends and close peer groups, the Ahl Bayt tells us very clearly that those groups have to be people who are mu'minin. Right? So we need to um, do what it takes to make sure that um, that is what our kids have in terms of their, the people that they spend time with. Um, what is the alternative to media so kids don't feel that they are out of this world? Um, as I mentioned, uh, reading books, right? Can, um, the children can be much, much smarter like if they're people who read books rather than um, be just sit in front of the TV and shut off their brain and just like, passively um, take whatever is fed to them. Um, another alternative is to talk to them, right? to take them in the outdoors, right? to teach them about, about the world. It's amazing the therapeutic effects of going out in nature right? are just profound. Um, you'll find if you take your kids hiking um, that you'll see the effects of it like in many ways. Like you'll see that they sleep better, that they're more um, disciplined, that they, they're just more energetic and more enthusiastic children. Um, so. Uh, there is alternatives to media. If you do want to use media, then make sure there's proper media, good media, like good movies. Um, and I did mention some of these in that document that I gave the link to in the presentation. How to erase the sex education impact that they have learned from public schools? Um, like in grade four last month, my school taught a story book, My Princess Boy. So how to clear this mind about this kind of wrong message? Um, it's very difficult. Like, it's very, very difficult to do that uh, because it's not just the book that's being taught. It's um, a way of, you know, understanding the book, a way of, you know, how to apply the book's messages to the world around us, right? And it's being taught by an authority figure um, that they, they naturally are going to recognize as an authority. Right? That is the reality that we're facing when we send our kids to public school. Um, so you're not going to be able to erase it, right? It's impossible. Um, because that's what's b being fed to them, and you're the one who is, who's providing that for them. Now, what's an alternative? An alternative is to pull them away from that, right? See what you can do to work with the, the administration to see and say, that, okay, this is something this, um, you know, it, it, that I'd like to pull my children out of, um, and to counter it as much as you can with um, what is the right messaging, what is the right stories, what is the right way of approaching these type of things. Um, if you don't have any other choice, and they have to study it, right, um, Meaning that it's a religious, like, like it's, it's a matter of, it's wajib on you to, for some reason. It's, it's a wajib thing for you to send your kids to read these type of books. 
like I would say that it's wajib for you to not to make them not read the books. But let's say for some reason it's wajib for you to send them to read the book. Um, then make sure you get that book, you bring it home, you read it yourself, and then after they have the discussion at school, you discuss it with your children and say that okay, on this page, this is what it says. Then how do I how do we understand it? What is our perspective? And then you can teach them that there's um, how how it's the case that it may be the case that we differ. Um, where when it comes to certain actions that people do, um, we can we can say that that's wrong, um, but that doesn't mean that we're against the people, right? And that's kind of like the best that we can do at that situation, where you separate, you try to separate things, and you say that look, at, we hope that these people are guided. We really, um, you know, we we don't have anything against them as a person, but the actions are not what in line with what the Quran and the Ahl Bayt teach us. Um, Okay, I think that pretty much summarizes the the questions that were. Uh huh. The last one is this. Yeah. So, shall we educate our children's? Uh, shall we educate our kids um, on not using YouTube? Um, there's a certain age where you can talk about why and why not. Right? You can give the why for the why for why you why you tell your children, your children certain things. Okay, but before that age, you can't really go into details because they're just not mature enough to understand. Um, so definitely, like definitely, like there's a certain age where you can explain to them that okay, look at YouTube. This, this is the thing. This is what they do. This is how they show ads. This is um, how they match, you know, and how they how it can be dangerous, right? And you teach them about why it's dangerous, um, for sure. Um, but but there's a certain age where that's appropriate. If you talk about it too much from beforehand, you can actually um, interest them, and you, you're sort of like teaching them something that they don't need to know about at this age, and that can cause that can backfire. You know, so um, you can be monitoring your child. Usually, around the age seven is when they start to like you know have enough maturity where you can they can start to sift through these things and they can understand that oh here's something which there's some good about it and there's some bad about it. Before that, you just have to for the most part you know basically say that no, YouTube is not something that you yourself will go on and choose. I'm going to choose it for you, and you put a um, you know password or a lock on your device, right? So that only you can access that device and you can choose the video for them. Um, what we do at home, just as a person, just as a tip, we, we have we have a we have a uh, like a TV screen, and we have something called Google Chromecast, which you plug into the TV screen, and whatever we want to display on the TV screen, we can choose that on our phone or our laptop. We can just press a button, and then it gets displayed on that screen. So our children will watch the screen, but we're fully in control of what goes on that screen. There is nobody who's independently like deciding what goes on the screen, except for the parents. So it's not connected to any type of cable or any type of TV or antenna or anything. It's purely controlled by what we want to um, have it have be on the screen from our device. And it costs like $50 or, or $40 or something for that thing. And there's other solutions as well. Um, so it is, since it is an era of smartphones, is, it our, is our community doing anything to educate kids um, using those phones? So this was one of the themes that came up in the questions that you asked was, what are we doing to educate our children about media and the use of media? Um, it is something that needs to be taught to our children. Like, um, in one of the responsibilities of Islamic schools and madrasas um, as part of Islamic curriculum is also teaching what is the Islamic teachings regarding media, right? In a way that our children can understand. Um, so that is something that, um, you know, Inshallah is being covered in the curriculum, but if it's not or it needs more coverage, then that's something that Inshallah, um, you know, the, the administrations here they're taking note of it, right? And it is something that Inshallah can be addressed as part of the curriculum because it needs to be um, taught to our students, like you know, what is what is the best practices, and it needs to be taught over multiple years as well too. Um, and you know, frankly speaking, like a lot of this like gets can be solved in the form of a discussion, right, with the older ones. Where you just sit around and you start talking about it and you and they begin become aware of like you know well what is it that's going on how much how much of who we are has been dictated to us by like Hollywood and by video games and these type of things about what we think about things. Okay, so those are what I got on in terms of writing. We have about um, a little bit less than ten minutes. Um, is there any um, questions that you have that you'd like to ask live before we end up the program? No? Okay. So 
With that, we ask for your dua. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.